me. Um, I, th I think Nicola made it sound like I had something coherent to say, but actually it's more of a random collection of thoughts about studio culture, so I shall do my best to live up to the intro. Um, this is our studio. It's open plan, like pretty much every other architecture practice in the world. Uh, collaboration is fundamental to what we do, and the, the space needs to support that. We don't go as far as the big communal table. Uh, we've all got individual kind of cellular desks, and we buzz about between them, so I suppose in that way it's a bit like a beehive rather than uh, a complete collective. We're in good company. Frank Lloyd Wright's studio was open plan, so take that as a, a good sign. Um, but... Uh, there's something about the space here with the exposed rafters and, and the light coming in. I don't know what it is about a studio being up in the roof that makes it seem more appealing. But interestingly, of course, there's, there's a big team. You know, we think of Frank Lloyd Wright and Louis Kahn as these singular visionary masters. But they all had, had help. But somehow that idea of the artist at his, at his easel is, is still very appealing to us. Um, and drawing is still fundamental to, to our practice. It's just that we do it now in computers. And I suppose there's a challenge there to think about how computer screens present barriers rather than drawing boards that you can lean on. As architects, we love the idea of artists as people with complete creative freedom. But, you know, their studios are really practical. Cezanne designed his own. He had this great slot in the side so that he could take paintings in and out and not have to take them down the stair. Um, so, so I, I love that practicality. Um, Gustav Courbet's famous painter in his studio, well, to those of you with an art educa education, I only discovered it looking for images for this talk. Uh, but he, he talks about the whole world passing through his studio, the best, the worst, and the average of society. And he's in the middle here, and he, he saw the painter as a mediator. Uh, I think architects need to be mediators too. Um, and maybe we need to let a, a bit of mess in and, and freedom to muck about. Um, you know, we, we, we work through the layers and, and the, the textures of places to try and find something new in them. Um, and this, if you hadn't guessed, was Pollock, uh, Jackson Pollock's studio. So, yeah, we, we need to let a bit of mess in. Of course, life has a way of providing mess for you, whether it's kind of everyday mess or catastrophic mess, like at Glasgow School of Art. Um, but these are pictures that... Um, the picture on the left is, is the fire-damaged architecture studio space overlaid with Bedford Le Maire's famous photographs. Uh, and what was amazing is that the fire revealed layers that had been covered up. But our studios say something ab about us, you know, whether they're grand and impressive, like the drawing office of, of a, an ocean liner company, you somehow the size of that's as important as the, the size of the boat and the rigor of it. But, but they talk about what we do. Um, I think the formality and structure of architectural practice is changing. Younger practices aren't restricted and held within their, their walls. They're getting out in the field, working directly with communities. Um, but that's not a new manifesto, really. Architects have been breaking out of the establishment forever, I think. Um, whether it's radical ideas or structures or movements, you know, like the social housing movement of the 60s and 70s or Buckminster Fuller's ideas about use of resources and efficient structure, we're always breaking down barriers or... Uh, sometimes we're just we're just dressing up. Da -da! <laughs> Timing, I knew that wouldn't work. Okay, at the turn of the century, um, yeah, here we go. We go there. Architects and uh, artists, you know, worked worked hand in hand. I think whether you were trained in the Beaux Arts or the Bauhaus, there was an intertwining of the kind of craft and science of architecture and art. Um, did the Bauhaus invent the crit? Probably they didn't, but um, that idea of presenting and critiquing work in a public forum, it's, it's a painfully thrilling exercise as an architecture student, and we do a lot of that in our studio still, um, because it, it gives you, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a performance, um, and, and, you know, it's a bit of a leap, I suppose, from the drawing board if you've been quietly working away on your own, and then you have to stand up and present it. Um, I think the studio gives you a place where you can hopefully talk freely amongst people who won't laugh out loud. Well, maybe sometimes. Um, but those kind of spaces for peer review are becoming more important in our education buildings, whether they're artistic, cultural, or scientific buildings. This is a science building for Glasgow Academy. Um, you know, we need to create spaces for students in between the desk and the, and the stage so that they can, they can practice. Um, I think our spaces need to be able to take a bit of clutter and, and feel like warm places to be with all the tools that you need at your fingertips. And we need to allow people to colonise their space and, and make it familiar to, to their way of working and suit how, how they want to be. Um, we're also designing studios for an architecture department and that feels like a kind of weird 
uh, Mobius time loop or something where we're in our studio, uh, you know, inspired by the studios that we were taught in, designing a new studio for students who might then go on and design studios. I'm sure that's some kind of uh, point in that <laughs> somewhere. Uh, but in all of this, I think the important thing is not to forget a sense of joy and, and gleefulness. Um, you know, that, that really that gleeful energy and buzz of looking at new things, hearing new ideas, I think that's probably why we're all here tonight, is, is what keeps us going. And I think we've got to try and, and support each other in that, uh, to create a space where people aren't afraid to speak up and, and use their voice. And occasionally, you know, we can reach out a hand to each other and, and help each other balance when we feel like uh, we're almost falling over. Brilliant timing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, sometimes, and yeah, and looking at things is always good fun together. Um, but sometimes you do fall over. Uh, uh, and, and I suppose that's where that, that culture of support and collaboration is, is really important in, in, in our, our way of working. Um, <clears throat> lost my place. So, yeah, reaching out a hand. Lovely, lovely image. I, th I think um, occasionally when you fall over, okay, some chair frames fall on you. <laughs> Um, the Eames designed a lot of, of chairs and practical things like leg splints for soldiers and they seemed to invent the whole idea of multimedia presentations. Um, but funnily enough, the king of in innovation said it, it should be a designer's last resort, which I really enjoyed hearing. He seemed to get, although he seemed to get there in every project. But yeah, I, I was at the, the exhibition at the Barbican earlier this year and they had this, this toy, this musical tower, which apparently sat in the, the, the entrance of the Eames studio. And, and when you started in the practice, you had to rearrange it. It was like a xylophone on its side, and you could rearrange it to play a new tune, which is quite intimidating when you think they played with Bernstein. But uh, a good reminder to play a little, and if all else fails, turn it on its side. <laughs>